Somebody is there, they might, you know, they might blow up the universe or something, and so that gets picked up on in the media. But that's not what the LHC is about. Hello. In this film, we're going to try and show you an experiment at CERN. Here is a map of the CERN site. It occupies an area of nearly six square kilometers. During the UNESCO conference in Geneva in February 1952, which was attended by Bohr, Thompson, Heisenberg, and other eminent European physicists, a European Council for Nuclear Research was founded. Following that conference, Paul Scherer said, we believe absolutely in building a large machine around which research will be done. Only a properly equipped laboratory will attract experimenters, prevent the dispersion of European talents, and stimulate the exploration of hidden forces. CERN's reason for being is still the same. Only the experiments have assumed a different dimension, and the physicists using it come not only from Europe, but from the whole world. For almost 20 years now, we've been uh, preparing this LHC project, and now, it's sort of a bit like the final straight, we're all racing to the finish line, and uh, so it's getting pretty exciting because later on this year we expect that for the first time we'll be actually bringing the particles into collision and we hope to start seeing some physics. Basically what the LHC is going to do is it's going to reproduce the conditions of the early universe and we think answer many of the puzzles about why the universe is the way it is today. So the LHC is uh, in this tunnel which has got a, a circumference of 27 kilometers, and the whole thing is about 100 meters underground. In the LHC, these particles are zooming around this racetrack faster and faster and faster, and these bunches going in opposite directions. So that occasionally, one of these meets one of those, and boom! And the whole thing is shattered, and literally hundreds of particles come out. And the detectors are surrounding this, trying to pick up these particles, capture them, and study them. The thing we think we will almost certainly, it's not a theorem, but almost certainly find, is something called the Higgs boson. The, Mr. Higgs is a chap, he was a professor in Edinburgh, uh, who suggested that this might be there. Uh, in the understanding that we developed in the last century, uh, we have a very beautiful theory based on very uh, beautiful principles. And one of these principles tells us that all matter should be without mass. How's that possible? I mean, what's matter if it doesn't have mass? I mean, you know, you've got mass. I've got mass. You've got mass. We're not all rushing around at the speed of light. So there's something missing. And uh, the idea of Mr. Higgs was that perhaps pervading the universe, there, there is something like a sort of fog out there. And as the particles move through it, uh, they interact with it, and, and they acute, gather bits around, and that gives them inertia, gives them mass. Another name for the Higgs particle is the God particle, and one main reason why it was given this name was the fact that it's a particle that is thought to give mass to every other particle in the universe. So essentially it makes all things. I guess that's where the God analogy came from. In the Higgs boson idea, this uh, thing is called the God particle. And it, ri it arouses the sort of idea in people's minds that if you look very carefully into the heart of matter, you'll find God. But that isn't a religious idea. That's a scientific misunderstanding of a religious idea. Because in religion, God is not an object like other objects, like you or me or a table or chair. And if you look carefully through a telescope, you'll find God, you know, like seeing something light years away with a powerful enough magnifying device. So in that way, to talk about the God particle for the Higgs boson is silly. And I explained all that when I went, and everybody was rather relieved, I think. 
And when people come to this cathedral, they are always surprised. They go through the door and they go, wow! That's exactly what I felt when I walked along this little gantry, went through a small door and looked down into this amazing space with this great thing in it. And that's an extraordinary thing to find, you know, under the Jura Mountains. I remember CERN as a wonderful place to work with lots of people, many young people, all driven by a terrific curiosity, trying to work together to understand what the universe is made of. It's a really great atmosphere at CERN because you really feel like you're in the centre of everything. There are similarities between the inside of a cathedral and the inside of CERN because in both places people are seeking truth. They're trying to find out things. They're working at things. The idea that religion is about faith in things that you can't see leads to a kind of superstitious attitude to religious questions and truth. And it leads to the idea that religion deals with what nobody else can deal with. I think that's a mistake. I think religion and science, philosophy and art, are all companions in searching for truth and understanding. For me, there is now a sharp distinction between science and philosophy. I see them as overlapping parts of the same spectrum, where at the end of more general, abstract, not yet very well-formed questions, you have philosophy. And as those questions become broken down into components, and you get a clear understanding of what exactly the question is, then you can begin to shift them towards theoretical science and then empirical science. What we scientists can do is describe mechanically the way the universe works and give people the tools for uh, using what is around and about us uh, in nature. Science, I don't think, can tell us why. It can tell us how. Tell us what, but you can't tell us why.